Good evening, good morning, and welcome everybody to Beer Bootcamp Sessions. With us we have this evening, we have esteemed author and the current chairperson of the Beer Girl Writers Association, uh, Mr. Pete Brown. Pete is known for being an author um, for a number of books, obviously, uh, listed up here. Um, Man Walks Into a Bar, Three Sheets to the Wind, and of course, High Fidelity, which was his recent book, nothing to do with beer, but obviously good British food. Beer, uh, Pete has won a number of awards as well. And Pete is going to be discussing uh, marketing um, during this time of, of, of lockdown for all of us at the moment. So please grab yourself um, a cold beer, uh, load it up, and Pete, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Jules. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you're coping well uh, in lockdown. Uh, we've got it slightly better here than you have. We've been in, in, in lockdown for longer, but we can still get beer delivered. So uh, I hope you've still got some too. Um, if you've been to beer boot camp in the last few years, you've probably seen me doing uh, presentations. Um, my presentations are usually quite funny. I'm not very technical. Uh, I, I'm not one to tell you how to uh, get rid of that uh, problem you've got with your yeast or how to get better utilization out of your hops or whatever. Um, but before I was uh, a beer writer, I, were, I worked in marketing uh, and I've done a lot of work on beer marketing uh, for big brands and small craft brands. And I've kind of worked on a lot of stuff, uh, kind of taking what I've learned from the biggest corporations in the world and adapting that so that small brewers can use it. And when Wendy asked me to do one of these sessions, uh, it reminded me of when, when I talked to a lot of small brewers uh, and say, here's how you could do your marketing, here's how you could uh, do some work on your brand, here's how you could do a bit of market research. Quite often I get a response which is, look, that all looks fantastic, that all looks great, but we're working 80 hours a week, just making the beer and getting it out there. We haven't got time to do this. And I figured that while you guys were on lockdown, uh, and you can't brew beer, um, maybe now is the time where to start thinking about what you do when this uh, is all over and you can get back, get back to things. So there's, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm working on a lot of projects now um, to, to really kind of bounce back on, once this is over. So what I'm going to take you through today is a presentation that I gave at BeerX, which is the uh, British, uh, I suppose, the British version of Beer Boot Camp. It's the, the big annual convention of small independent brewers in the UK. Uh, and they asked me to do this presentation on market research. I, I do a lot of market research myself. And being small and independent, they were saying, look, they, they gave me the title and said, look, is it always, uh, have the big brewers always one step ahead? Uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about for about sort of 35, 40 minutes. I shall just try and share my screen. I've got PowerPoint slides. I bet you never thought you'd be getting a PowerPoint presentation uh, while you're locked down at home uh, during a uh, virus epidemic, but here we go. Um, so is uh, is big beer always one step ahead? Um, just before I answer that question and try and get my slides to move forward, why aren't you moving? Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. So when I said I've done a lot of uh, marketing in, in beer, people do tend to forget this when I'm writing books about falling in uh, to canals from boats and taking beer to India and things. Uh, these are a lot of the brands I've worked on, mostly uh, UK brands, a few European ones. Uh, and a lot of what I have to do in this is either doing the market research itself or interpreting the market research, looking at the data and seeing what we can get out of it. And that's really what my, what my skill is. Uh, so, hmm. Um, a question that I hear quite a lot when I'm talking about this uh, is uh, this famous quote, uh, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies and statistics. Uh, and this is often said by people in response to uh, statistics figures that they don't believe. Um, but sometimes I come across people who just say this and think that that is an argument. If I say, if I say, um, you know, 95% of people want to drink a craft beer, you could, if you didn't want to believe that, you could just say, well, there are lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, so I build on that by saying, 
And then there are people, there's a fourth group of people, people who just don't understand the subject and just repeat this phrase to hide their ignorance. Uh, because people do use statistics in misleading ways, but that doesn't mean that statistics are misleading. They can be. They can be if you want them to be. And I'll talk about how to make them misleading or polish them anyway, uh, as, we, as we get on. Uh, because statistics aren't um, damning. To st statistics, really, if you think about market data, it's just raw material. Think about it the same way you think of hops. Now, you can make something really good out of hops. You can make something terrible out of hops. And numbers, data, uh, is exactly the same. The data is the raw material. It's, it's what you do with it uh, that counts as to whether it's actually useful or, or beneficial or not. Um, so... What you do with it, uh, I, we'll talk about data, which, you know, numbers, statistics, whatever. Um, doing something with that data is research. And then what you get from research is a word that marketers in big corporations absolutely love and fetishize over, uh, the word insight. And I just want to explain what I feel is the difference between them. Um, data is, is an example. Uh, so data is numbers. Uh, let's say we've done a survey of uh, people who drink beer at Cascale, Real Ale in the UK. And the people we spoke to, 837 uh, of those people, uh, said that they drink Cascale sometimes. So how many? How did they break down in between the sexes? Uh, there were 711 of them were male, uh, 126 of them were female. That's data. That's just numbers, flat numbers on its own. In terms of turning that into research, what, what the research is what the data is telling us. And that's telling us that 85% of cask drinkers in the UK are male. That's a really big number. And insight is what you take out of that. It's what you learn from it. It's what thinking you get from it. Uh, there's a brilliant quote somewhere about looking at uh, research and seeing something that no one else has seen, looking at the same thing everyone else has seen and spotting something that no one else has spotted. Um, so an insight into this data would could be there's potentially a huge opportunity to grow real ale in the UK by making it more appealing to women because hardly any women are drinking it. Now, even in the biggest, um, even in the biggest market research companies, in the biggest client organisations, I'm talking Unilever, and I was InBev, whatever. People will look at the research bit, the middle line, and say that's an insight. It's not an insight. It's just statement. Um, the insight is looking at the numbers and then getting something from it. Like I, like I keep saying, I've said that several times now, but it's just because, like I say, big professional people I work with don't, don't get that difference. And this is one reason why big bros are not always one step ahead. They're junkies for numbers. They're junkies for data. Uh, and they don't often turn uh, that data, or quite a lot of the time, they don't turn that data into real useful insight. Anybody can be clever and look at the thinking. Um, and only the big bros can look at a load of data and not get the right things out of it. So why would you want market data in your, in your brewery, in your organization? Uh, there's quite a few different reasons uh, that people use data. I think the most valid one, the most important one, is understanding your market and your consumer. How do you know what they're going to buy if you don't understand their motivations, their preferences, you know, understanding uh, when they want to be here, uh, the, the reasons they want to be here, what mood they're in when they want to be here. All those are kind of understanding your consumer. And that's what uh, market data is really important for. An increasingly, um, an increasingly common secondary use of data is creating publicity. And this is what trade organizations do. As, as a writer every day, uh, not much at the moment, but, but you know, <laughs> before things went weird, um, I'd get press releases almost every day from uh, an organization saying, hey, we've just done some research and we found out that 57% um, uh, of people say that they'd buy beer more often if it was pink. And it's like, when was this commissioned by a brewer who makes pink beer? Ah, yes, it was. What a surprise. Um, and so, but, you know, it, it, they, they'll, they'll, they'll put some numbers out there to say, you should be looking at our products. You should be taking us more seriously. Um, less valid than that, I would say, is using data to win an argument. And I'm afraid I've been guilty of this quite often. Um, if I'm working with a client in a big organization uh, and they believe one thing and I believe another thing, we will both look for data that proves our argument. And this is when you start to twist the data a little bit and go, well, it says this. No, it doesn't. It says that. Um, and covering your ass. This is probably the most common use of data in a big uh, organizing organization like Anheuser-Busch InBev. No one wants to be wrong. People in big organizations 
are terrified of making decisions uh, because their arse is on the line if that decision turns out to, to be wrong. Uh, and so people will research something to death just so that they can make the decision and say, well, look, the research said it was right, so you can't blame me if it was wrong. Um, uh, and and I've, I've, I've seen that happen so often. I worked on a butter brand in the UK and we wanted to make some ads that the client was a bit nervous about and they did so much research to cover their asses they ended up spending all the media money that they were going to use to put the ad on tv and in magazines so by the time we've done all the research to show that the ad would work they had no money left to actually run the ad and there's a great quote in the industry uh, like a drunk in a lamppost you should use market research for illumination uh, and not support you should use it to find out things to see things rather than just to kind of lean on it And this will, it's never done this before. Right, so is, don't worry about this. Don't, don't be terrified by this, but I'm gonna show you uh, how big organizations uh, use data. If you're looking and saying, well, they, they spend a million quid on research every year. How can I compete with that? This is a, a real slide uh, from when I worked on a credit card. Uh, I don't understand it myself. I didn't understand it when it was presented to me. Uh, and if you look at the headline there, it says, uh, it says, Morgan Stanley performs better than goldfish at converting awareness to trial. However, in the category, awareness is important at driving trial as a whole. Okay, just bear that in mind. I've got one more to show you. It just, there's something really weird going on here. Right, just try this. Um, right. Yes, here's the next one. Converting trial to usage is more of a linear relationship. The more people who trial, the more likely they are to use. Right? So this is this is like you know 200,000 quid a year they're spending on this uh, research to get uh, this these findings so I, I sat down and translated what these headlines mean took me a while My screen is just not responding. Yeah, here we go. So that, what that first chart is telling us, when you get down to it and you boil it down, is if people have heard of something, they're more likely to try it than people who have never heard of it. And the second chart is telling us, people who have tried something once are more likely to use it again than people who have never tried it. 200 fucking grand a year and that's that's what they've learned i think most children could have told you that without spending the 200 grand on research so the first big point about other big brewers always one step ahead is having greater access to the material to the data doesn't mean you're good at knowing what to do with it uh and i want to show you an ad uh jules nod or nod or shake your head if this ad plays okay What's going on? I'll be right with you, Mr. Potter. Yeah, okay. 
So that's a campaign that I worked on in 2002, I think it was. Uh, so this is a launch of broadband internet in the UK uh, and British Telecom were launching the whole broadband thing. Um, and we got given this brief to say, you've got to kind of try and explain to people what broadband is and how different it is from old dial up internet. So, you know, the creative idea there is we're going to dramatize all the stuff that's coming that through broadband, all stuff that you've probably not been able to get on a dial-up internet connection before. You're going to have to watch movies, you're going to get stuff delivered, uh, all sorts of brilliant stuff. So the idea, obviously, is that the broadband pipe in the street bursts and all the content comes out of the pipe and the BT engineer has to get it back in. It's a visual demonstration of, of what you're going to be able to get on broadband. Now, that was a massive ad for BT, so they spent an absolute ton of money on researching it to make sure it was working properly. Uh, and I was in there trying to turn that research into insight. So um, if you've ever done those things where you're in a, a shopping mall and someone comes up to you with a clipboard and says, uh, can you remember seeing any ads for, for, for broadband? Uh, can you remember seeing, if I show you some pictures from this ad, can you remember seeing this ad? If you've seen it, can I ask you what you thought of it? Did you think it was A, this, or B, this, or C, this? Um, we did that with thousands of people. Now, one of the questions they asked on these surveys was, is this ad believable? Yeah. So when we had the research debrief to the client, uh, we say, oh, people have seen it. Uh, it's cut through. They remember it. They remember it's for BT um, and they um, like it a lot. They really enjoy watching it. But we've got a real problem because they don't think the ad is believable. To which I said, you've got a hundred foot fucking dragon walking down the street. Of course, the ad is not believable. And what this is a classic example is of asking the wrong questions. Now, if they'd phrased that as were the claims the ad was making believable, then, you know, dad is claiming that you're going to be able to get a lot of content down a pipe. We're not literally saying that there are dragons and spitfires and barbarians uh, coming down a pipe in your street. So no, the ad is not believable, but that is not the question we should be asking. Uh, asking the right questions is absolutely key to getting the right research. I'll show you another ad. Um, this is um, from 1974, uh, and this is the ad that transformed Britain uh, into a country that drank lager instead of ale. So it's the first, ad, first TV ad from Heineken in the UK. And um, uh, it had this, this, this a campaign idea, Heineken refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. Uh, and it's a really, I mean, it's so old now. Remember, this is, you know, 40 odd year, years old. Um, but at the time it broke a lot of rules. Uh, it was the first time that humor had been used in beer advertising. It was the first time that a beer advert was a gag. Um, so at the time there's this very cliched idea that British policemen uh, stood on the corner of the street making sure everything was okay and they would bend their knees and flex their knees and these policemen are too tired to do that anymore uh, so they need the refreshment of Heineken. In this simple experiment we examine the effect of beer on the feet. Now these feet have been walking all day and are very tired. We see that there is no movement in them which is due to lack of refreshment. So we administer the cooled Heineken. Wait a few seconds, and we observe that the Heineken is already refreshing the feet, causing lively movements of the toes and activating the arches. <laughs> Heineken is the only beer able to do this, because it refreshes the part other beers cannot reach. So, in 1970, lager was 3% of all the beer in the UK. Uh, by 1980, it was 30% of all the beer in the UK um, because people love these funny ads. You know, we only had one commercial TV channel at the time. So if this ad came on in the middle of Coronation Street, everybody was going to see it. Um, and it almost never ran because they researched it in focus groups. Um, 
And this is some of the things that people said. Well, this is what they, the focus group moderator said. The mental image they obtained appeared to carry almost medical overtones. Heineken came across as a great restorative, but the commercial ignored the equally important sheer enjoyment the respondents expected to gain from a lager. One respondent maintained that the policeman commercial would be more effective as a Lucas aid ad. And the slogan, refreshes the parts of the beers cannot reach, was seen as appropriate to the rest of each commercial, but not on its own. Respondents had great difficulty record, recalling it. On its own, it doesn't stick, no rhythm about it. So what they're missing here is the humour in the ad. The fact that the ad is sending up other ads. It's taking the piss out of other ads. And also the researcher is just listening to what people say and writing it down and, and not thinking about it. So if they'd listened to research here, then Lager would still, I mean, it might, might be a good thing. Heineken might never have taken off uh, and Lager might still be a, a minority product in the UK. We might also still be drinking real ale. Um, but that thing about the slogan refreshes the parts of the beers cannot reach, uh, which doesn't stick and has no rhythm about it is still the most memorable beer advertising end line in the history of British beer advertising. It's in the Oxford Dic Dictionary of Quotations as the most memorable advertising line of all time. So it's really important to, to look at your research properly and to really, to really listen to it and make sure that you're getting the right, the right things out of it. So that's how big brewers do it. And that's how big brewers often get it wrong. So how do you compete with them? in terms of getting the data and then using it to using it better than they do, basically. Um, so getting the data, I mean, the big guys spend, like I say, hundreds of thousands of pounds a year um, and they, they work directly with the research companies um, and they design the research around their products. They, they ask the specific questions that they want to know. Um, but that's not the only way to get market data. And it's sticking again. I'm, I'm guessing it's because of Zoom. Or, yeah, yeah, I'm guessing it's because of Zoom that keeps doing that. So th this is this is a little bit boring, but then I'll, then it gets exciting again. Uh, there's different kinds of research. Desk research is a report that someone's written uh, that you can access. Original research is stuff you do for yourself uh, that you design for yourself for your own specific needs. And then there's two main types of research within that. There's qualitative, which is texture and detail and really getting into understanding of something and quantitative which is getting the numbers the stats the big picture and you kind of need a balance of both the numbers can tell you so much the numbers could tell you that 13 people 13 million people in the uk drink craft beer but it can't tell you why uh, or, you, or or you might be able to ask them a, a bunch of questions but you've only got the answer to those questions you can't ask the follow-up questions you can't get the uh, the detail whereas if you just got the the one on the left hand side you can talk to people for ages about how they feel their deep feelings their beliefs their emotions but if you don't got the numbers then you don't know if their feelings and emotions are representative of a broader group of people so it's about working with both uh, and so then you get this kind of uh, desk research original research qual and quant uh, and here's how you might get uh, the equivalent of that so for desk research whether it's when it's large scale numbers or small scale talk to people, raid the internet, uh, just Google stuff. You'd be, you'd be amazed how much stuff is on there, uh, which I'll come on about. Qualitative, deep research, go and talk to people. And quantitative, create your own survey. So I'll tell you how to do that. So some useful data sources. Uh, I, I've done projects for small bros where I don't have any budget and I've just Googled stuff and found loads of reports. Uh, Mintel is a massive global market research agency. Um, they'll do like a report on say the African beer market once every two years, and you've got to pay about $2,000 to get hold of that. Uh, and there's not actually that much in it. But in order to sell those reports, they also do reports that they give away for free. So uh, on the right hand side here, this is a screenshot from their website. And these are just three of the reports that are there for free for you to download. Global consumer trends, global food and drink trends. Um, and you can get that for nothing. Uh, and they're not the only ones. There's lots and lots of people who, who do that. There's a, a, a website I found last year called Report Linker. And people put all sorts of stuff out there. And you pay Report Linker, uh, I think it's about $40 a month. And you can access all the reports that you can search by subject area, you can search by country. 
Uh, and what I did was I, I got a subscription for one month and, uh, and I was getting things like Diageo's entire sustainability plan uh, and all the detail of it, things like that. I was getting numbers for craft beer drinkers in the States. I was getting numbers for uh, the strengths and weaknesses of um, uh, bourbon whiskey versus scotch whiskey. Uh, there was an amaz amazing amount of detail, just kind of log on, do it for a bit, uh, and then, then sort of cancel the subscription. And then industry PRs, uh, like I was saying, people do research to send out in press releases. Um, and they put a lot of detail in that. They, they'll, do, they'll do a report to show that, um, uh, they'll, they'll do a report, I say, on sustainability in order to try and make their client look like they're leading the conversation on, on sustainability. So, so do have a look around uh, and spend some hours while you're, while you're, while you're at home. Uh, spend some hours just find, Googling what market research you can find uh, about, the, about the local market. Creating your own quant data uh, your own survey is surprisingly straightforward, actually. Uh, I use SurveyMonkey, uh, which you can use for free. Um, you get a basic level where you can build your own questionnaire, uh, ask whatever questions you want. And if you've got a good social media network, you just tweet out the link to the survey on SurveyMonkey and, uh, and get, some, get some data back. Uh, there's a thing called One Pulse where you can ask questions and get the data back in real time, though you do have to pay for that. Um, if you've got a decent Twitter follow, just do a Twitter poll. Uh, say, here's three beers. We, here's three beers we're thinking of launching. Which one would you be most likely to buy? Um, or even just just be creative about it. Put some imagination into it. So, Innocent Smoothies is one of the biggest, most successful UK drinks brands of the last twenty odd years, and they started at the Glastonbury Music Festival. Uh, I think they worked in marketing. These two lads. Uh, and they made up a whole bunch of these fruit smoothies and they had a table at the Glastonbury Festival and they had two bins and they had a big sign saying, try one of our smoothies. If you think uh, we should stick to our day jobs, uh, please put your uh, empty cup uh, in the no bin. If you think we should give up our jobs and make these fruit smoothies full time, please put your empty cup in the yes bin. And the yes bin was overflowing and there was no nothing in the no bin, so they gave up their jobs and launched a really successful brand. So there's different ways you can do it. And so long as you're not just taking the piss, so long as, so long as there's, it's like, no, it is a serious question, even if we're doing it in a fun way, the numbers are valid, the numbers are valid. So um, it's, 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 it's useful to do. Um, I've talked about, it's important to ask the right questions, uh, frame, frame them as simply as you can. Uh, if you're doing something like SurveyMonkey, but also if you can get a few demographics. So if you can just give people, you, you want to know who's responding. Um, so if you can just say, would you mind us asking how old you are, whether you're male or female? And, and when you give the answers, when you give the answer options for that to people to take, you, you, can, you can ask someone's age by just saying, are you, well, the standard breaks in the industry are uh, 18 to 24 or legal drinking age, if it's not 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, and so on. And so people feel a lot com more comfortable ticking a a band like that rather than just kind of filling in how old they actually are. Uh, you can put things as a male, male, female, other, prefer not to say, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and if you've got that data, you know who's responding because uh, you don't know who's that. People who are into what you're doing are far more likely to fill in your survey than people who aren't really interested in what you're doing. So it's important you know who they are. Uh, don't make the survey too long. Uh, I think about eight or nine questions is what people are the sort of maximum of what people are willing to to answer uh, and they'll get a bit bored after that uh, always leave a space for comments uh, if you're on something like survey monkey it'll say would you like to leave a, a a text box here and just just leave just put a thing going is there anything else you'd like to add and this is where you get a load of stuff for free because re people who are really really into it uh, into beer or, or whatever they're dying to tell you how to do your job properly. They're, they're dying to get stuff off their chest uh, and, and really engage. And I, the last time I did this on SurveyMonkey, I got more from the comments box than I did from the answers to the questions that I'd asked. Creating up qualitative data, there's, there's, um, there's different ways that people do this. Uh, the most popular way is focus groups, which everyone uses, all countries use for, in politics now. You get about eight to ten people in a room and you uh, sit down 
and you ask them questions. That, that's what happened with the Heineken ad that I showed, uh, and they got it quite wrong. Um, but there's some tricks to doing it right, uh, and there's different ways of doing this research. I mean, the, the most simple way is go to a bar and talk to people. And that might sound facetious, but this book here, Britain and Mass Observation, that's just what they did. Uh, this is a guy called Tom Harrison, who uh, used to be a social anthropologist, and he used to study tribes in the Amazon and that kind of thing. And then he thought, well, why don't we use this to study ourselves as well as other people, you know? And so he came back to the north of England, and he went to, he said, he got a team of researchers who just went to pubs, bought a drink and sat at the bar, and just chatted to people about what they were worried about, about what they're concerned about, about what they are happy about. And they watched people and they just wrote everything down. Uh, so that is valid research. And it's actually market research is moving back towards doing something like that because of the issues with focus groups. Think about recruitment and selection. It's quite easy. I mean, if you were to say, right, we're getting, we, we want eight people to come to uh, this bar uh, tomorrow night and uh, we'll, be, we'll give you some free beers. We just want to ask what you think of them. Uh, and record what you say about them, if that's okay. Uh, and you'll easily get people turning up. Just make sure that you get the people that you want. Um, uh, don't get people who are definitely not interested. Don't get people who are just going to say yes to everything you say. Um, I'm minimizing research effect. Um, I think I'll come back to that later. So using your data, once you've, once you've gathered it, whether it's numbers or whether it's, you know, if you recorded something, transcribe it, get quotes from people, they're gonna come in really useful. But once you've got all that, it's how you interpret it. So this is, this is my complicated slide, but it's not as bad as it looks. So if we go back to this hypothetical research that I did about Cascale in the UK. So let's say we, let's say we talked to a total of 2,800 2, people and those people said they drink real ale. It was 800, 837 said, yes, they did. Uh, so 1,953 said that, no, they didn't drink Cascale. So you put those numbers down as simple numbers. Now, as simple numbers, they don't really mean much on their own because how does that relate? How does that compare to people? Um, so you, you turn those numbers into percentages. So we can see that of all the people we spoke to, 30% uh, of people drink real ale, 70% of people don't. Uh, and then we brought, as I, like I showed, that figure I showed you earlier, 85% uh, of the people who say they do are male. And this is, this is where it gets interesting in terms of how you present your data, because saying 30% saying, saying of people, saying only 30% of real ale, of, sorry, let me start that again. So we spoke to a represent, representative sample of beer drinkers, and only 30% of people say they drink real ale. Doesn't sound very good. Doesn't sound like a good research finding. So what you could do, and this is this is spin rather than lying, but if you know what the proportion of, uh, if you've got some basic stats for the whole population of the country, uh, you can gross your data up uh, to say how how if if our data is true, this is what it would mean in terms of the entire population. So those two thousand eight hundred people we've asked, if they have got roughly similar age split roughly similar uh, gender splits to the population as a whole, then we say this is a small representation of attitudes that exist on a national basis. So, so Britain's a country of uh, you know, 66 million people. We say only 30% of our sample drinks real ale, but if you gross that up to be rep representative of the UK as a whole, that's 15.6 million. So you can just say, so you can say, hey, we've got some research. 15.6 million people drink real ale. Sounds a lot better than 30%. So it's about looking at how, you're, how you present your data to, to its best effect. With that number underneath, um, yeah, 85% of uh, men uh, drink real ale. Now you might not want to give away too much of your data, but you might still want to use it. Uh, you might not want to, you might want to make a point, but not give away the stuff that you've paid for and, and put all that hard work into getting. So again, if you've got, if you know that you're representative of uh, the population as a whole, you can, you can present your data as an index rather than as an absolute number. So given that in, in Britain, uh, men and women, it's roughly a 50% split. If 85% of men, uh, sorry, fifty-five percent of real ale drinkers are men. That's a lot higher than the uh, average um, population. That means they've got an index of one hundred and seventy. So if you know, if fifty-fifty split is hundred, that's the base for the index. 
So 85% is an index of 170. So you can see from that that men are far, far more likely to drink uh, real ale than women are without actually giving your numbers away. And I will put this presentation, I'll send this presentation to Wendy and Jules so that you can look at this in a bit more detail if you want to. So that was an example of spin. Uh, here's an example of distortion, which is bringing together how you present the data, but also asking the right question. So this is one, this is one that I have seen. This is a genuine example. I've, I've made the numbers up, but this is a genuine example. Um, I got a piece of research sent through to me, and this is back uh, about 10 years ago when uh, the bigger breweries um, were quite scared by the growth of uh, smaller regional local breweries, and they wanted to kind of kill that off if they could. So I got a, I got a thing saying um, only five percent of drinkers care whether beer is local or not, and I thought, well, that's surprising. Um, that doesn't sit with what I thought, and so, I, so I, I looked into it in a bit more detail. And this is always important when you get sent research like this. So what what actual question did you ask? And the question they actually asked was. Which of the following is the single most important to you when choosing a beer? Now, as you'd expect, the, by far the biggest answer is the flavor. And people said style, ABV, price, local. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's at the bottom. So when this question was asked, it was asked as what's the single most important thing? And people could only take one answer. So if you think, fla so if you think local brewer is important, but not as important as flavor, then you can't express that as an opinion. So saying that this shows that only 5% of drinkers care whether beer is local or not is a total lie based on the question that was asked, because that is not the question that was asked. Um, you could ask it a different way. Which of the following do you take into consideration when choosing a beer, tick as many as apply? And if you give them the same set of answers, you might get local breweries 42 Flavor is still way more important, but local breweries 42%. So the headline from that would could be, almost half of beer drinkers think local brewers are important. You know, asking a question which is almost the same, but just tweaking it slightly, you get a completely different result. So it's uh, really, really worth looking at very carefully. I talked, I mentioned the research effect. Uh, if you know the idea of Schrodinger's cat in philosophy, I've forgotten who it is. Um, uh, the idea that if you've got a cat, <laughs> I don't know why it's a cat. Uh, if you've got a cat inside a closed box, um, you don't know if the cat is alive or dead. If you open the box to find out, then you opening the box might have killed the cat. So while the cat is still in the closed box, the cat is both alive and dead. And that's nonsense. But but what it, what it is, is that the act of you doing something can change the results that you get. And this is what I mean by the research effect. If you do a focus group, you're not talking to people in a natural environment. They've probably never been to one before. They're probably feeling a bit uncomfortable wondering what to do. Uh, and so if you say, which beers do you like in that situation, you may well get a different answer uh, than you would if you were just out with that person for a drink uh, or, or what they would say to their friends. And, and this is the thing about going back to the Heineken example, when you look at those quotes. I've put this picture up on the right because I did some research a couple of years ago uh, for Cascale. Uh, and I was making different statements about Cascale, saying, oh, it's natural, it's natural condition in the cellar, it uh, has live yeast, all this kind of stuff. And I sent the recordings to be typed up as uh, transcripts. And when I get the transcripts back, um, and I say, what do you think of that? Would that make you drink real ale? And the transcripts said, yes, that's really interesting. Yes, I would probably drink more Cascale uh, if, if they marketed it like this. And I thought, no, that's not what happened. And I thought back to the groups. And when people were saying that, they looked like this woman on the right. So, yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And I could tell they didn't really mean it. They were just saying it because they thought that's what I wanted to hear. So it's, it's really important to make sure that you're looking, you're, you're listening to what they're saying, but you're also looking at their body language. Uh, you're taking into account the context where you are, all, all that kind of stuff. And that's it. Sorry, I didn't realise I was so near the end. Um, but I, that, that was a lot to get through. Uh, but then we've all got a lot of time to think about it. Uh, I'll send these slides over. And, and just if you are curious, if you've got any questions about your local market or anything like like I say, just, just spend a few hours exploring it. Maybe look at MailChimp, so not MailChimp, sorry, SurveyMonkey, uh, put a few things together, do a, do a little Twitter poll and, and just play with the numbers, see what you think. Back to you, Jules. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was absolutely great as our first uh, beer bootcamp session. Uh, we do have one or two questions here. Um, 
first question we have from Cape Town. Um, so yes, uh, we could build a brand culture and awareness now. Uh, do you seriously see us as breweries that we can recover from this basically the epidemic? Uh, what would socializing look like after this from your opinion? <laughs> Fantastic question. Uh, I mean, I could we could do an entire session on that. Um, it's obviously one that we're thinking about everywhere around the world. Um, I was talking to my wife about it just last night. What, one thing I do know for sure is that when we're allowed back out and pubs and bars are allowed to reopen, it's going to be carnage. People are pining for bars. They're missing them. Um, we, we, we want to talk to people. It's amazing how you miss physical contact with people, just touching people, hugging people or shaking hands or, or, or anything else. Uh, and I think we're going to go back out in a massive, massive way. The issue is that obviously people with big cash reserves uh, and big infrastructures are much better place to sit it out and to, and to weather it out um, than, uh, than, than smaller organizations. And that, that's worrying all of us around the world a, a, a great deal. Um, but just speculating now, um, I think, I mean, here in the UK, the supermarkets are doing so well that you know all the home delivery services we have, you can't get slots on them. They're booked up for months. Um, the shelves are bare if you go there. Um, as the supermarkets are going to massively increase the power they have uh, in a, in a retail in the retail context, even more than they had before. But I, my personal opinion, my my belief is that when we're locked down at home, um, our um, our kind of what what can I call it? Our our, our sort of uh, our world becomes smaller. Uh, we become much more concerned with local, uh, with small, with intimate. Um, and here in in our house, neither of us are going out at all. And so we're spending all that time at home. And the garbage was collected yesterday, and we had about a third of the amount of garbage that we normally have, because we're just not wasting anything. We're not throwing any food away. Uh, we're being much more concerned and careful about what we have in the house. We now know exact everything that's in our freezer and everything that's in our cupboards. Uh, and I think that's going to give us a kind of a, a more careful mentality, more localized mentality, which could mean that we support small businesses a, a lot more than we did. I, that's what I hope. That's great. Um, then the next thing, obviously, because there's no research currently in this, are we predicting the future? Um, and how do we try and prepare for this? Well, one thing I will say that this is this is completely different from a recession. It's on a scale of magnitude difference. But I started work professionally in advertising. We had a big recession in 1991 in the UK. Uh, a big uh, interest rate soared and uh, the economy collapsed and stuff. And when things bounced back, because they do always bounce back, and when they, when they bounced back, it was really interesting. The brands that the brands that had really invested during the recession were the ones that really prospered afterwards. And so you, you could say that uh, you know, what's the point in us advertising when no one can drink? And as soon as people could drink again, they remembered the people who'd been talking to them during the during the shit time. Uh, and so even if it's just a question of keeping up a prominent social media presence and just trying to uh, just trying to engage with people, talk to people, carry on conversations. Um, I think when 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 things are back to normal or getting back to normal, you've built a brand. I'm, I'm, I'm using the jargon deliberately. I hate saying it, but you're, you're kind of building a brand relationship with with potential consumers. It's like that guy was really funny on Twitter when we couldn't get any beer. I can't wait to check out his beer kind of thing yeah good stuff and of course the last one is are you expecting a boom with regards to local business as a whole as the people rush back uh to their to their hangout spots yeah i, th I think i think that's what i said to and answer the last one really um it's that it's that it's that game of two halves i think on, on the one hand the bigger the bigger guys are going to have more power on the other hand i do think i, I want to believe this but i think i'm possibly right uh, but I think people will have um, more interest in local because I think I think we become more local. I, I think I think our sphere of influence, our sphere of awareness, becomes more local. You know, going going out onto the street is going to seem like 
a massive adventure. <laughs> so, so you're not going to, you know, you, you're going to want to kind of stay in this community, I think. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And uh, we've also, as a, a community of, of uh, craft brewers here locally in South Africa, we all kind of wondering, you know, support local, get to your local brewery, um, either buy it online and things like that. And um, yeah, it's also very important as well. Now, I believe that you have been, well, you've been in quarantine before you were in lockdown. Um, what have you been working on, Pete? <laughs> uh i'm I'm working on a couple of books i mean one thing i did so in the in the uk you know the, the hospitality sector pubs and bars were the first things to close um about a week and a bit before we had actual lockdown that the pubs restaurants bars were all closed um and i make my living i make my career writing about pubs bars brewers and restaurants so i'm a freelance i'm a freelance writer in the sector of the economy that's been hardest hit by by the whole thing um, as of three weeks ago, I had zero household income, uh, no household income for the foreseeable future. So I thought, what can I do about this? And I thought, well, people people pay me for what I write and what I say. Um, can I cut out the middleman and, and do that myself? So I set myself a project to write and self-publish a book in 13 weeks, and I'm now on week two. Uh, so it's a book about the nature of craft. Uh, it's based on a presentation I did at Beer Boot Camp last year, uh, which went down really well. Uh, I wasn't thinking of writing a, a book about it at that point. And then everyone afterwards came up to me and said, when is the book out? <laughs> so <laughs> I, started, I started work on that. Um, and so I'm learning all about e-publishing uh, and self-publishing. Um, so there's me and my wife, we're a team. I'm writing I'm writing two, 3,000 words a day. Uh, Liz is learning about... Um, uh, programs and format platforms for for publishing ebooks and then for distributing them we're looking at patreon uh, we're looking at a kindle um all these different options and just learning totally new stuff and finding ways to make money to get people to pay me for what i do <laughs> uh that doesn't involve anyone else really and it's and it's really exciting apart from apart from you know born of desperation because we've got to get some money and no one's giving to we, uh, as, as a sort of as a, as a small limited company, I'm in the only sector in the UK that's not getting a handout from the government. So if you work for a big company, you're getting 80% of your salary from the government. If, you, if you're self-employed, uh, you're getting um, help. Uh, if you're a small company like me, then you, you get the chance to apply for a loan. So I have to find a way to make money. And it's, it's desperate and it's worrying, but it's also quite exciting because we're learning new skills. We're doing stuff we hadn't done before. And the general kind of spirit of it is that once this is over i might well have an income stream that i didn't have before <laughs> so that's what i'm looking at and also working on the book is brilliant it's it's really exciting no brilliant that's awesome uh, we actually got a couple more questions in at the moment um we've got two more in um how applicable do you think market research done in other parts of the world or in a place like south africa um how do you try and extract the insights from from research like this that is a really, really good question. That, that, that's a damn good question. Um, and I think the answer would vary depending on where you on, on what, what you're doing, what, what your business is. I think in craft beer, it's pretty applicable. Um, so in the UK, we're about two years behind the United States. So if I was looking at, so from a UK perspective, if I was looking at market research from the States, I could be pretty sure that a lot of it would be applicable here as well. I think wherever you are in the world, people like IPAs for the same reasons. I think people have the same conversations about hops. Uh, I think if you, I mean, I've traveled, particularly last year, I traveled all around the world uh, doing events and, and conferences and things like that. And I was having exactly the same conversations with craft beer drinkers in Melbourne, as I was in Joburg, as I was in London, as I was in San Francisco. It was the same conversation because these people and these breweries they're all talking to each other in real time on social media nowadays. So I think it might not apply if you were talking about uh, particular, say, you know, nationally based food varieties. I think, I think if, I, if I was getting research from California about Mexican food, I probably wouldn't apply that to London because <laughs> it's totally different. But I think if we're talking craft beer, I know South Africa is a bit behind the curve of some other countries. Um, but you can look at what the countries have got and say, yeah, I mean, we, we, I know there's, there's local wrinkles about legislation and things like that that I don't know about. 
Um, but I'd say general trends, you could look at other countries and go, yeah, okay, that's, that's going to be pretty similar here. Excellent. And then something just slightly off the beer topic, but I suppose you can, can do it as well. We've got, um, uh, could you give advice to another freelance research writer? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy if you want to uh, share my details with anyone who wants to uh, get in touch. What we'll do is I will um, send through the details um, to him and then you can be in touch yeah. with you as well and be able to touch other than that. Yeah, also um, I've decided, uh, given that I'm writing this book over 13 weeks, I am blogging about the experience. Uh, and so I'm sharing, I'm sharing my experience of writing a book on lockdown uh, in case that's useful for, uh, for anybody else. And I will be doing an online workshop on writing a book as well at some point with the British Guild of Beer Writers. Excellent. Well, what we'll do is we'll put it in the link because what we're going to do is we're going to share this on our brand new Beer Boot Camp channel on YouTube, which we actually launched this evening. We will be having our next session on, on Friday evening with a gentleman uh, from uh, originally from Lebanon, but now he's in Australia. If anyone wants to take a guess, uh, the gentleman's <laughs> name is, is Mr. Marzen Hajar, and he will be talking about what to do when life throws you lemons. So <laughs> it's always good value. Us. Yeah, he's going to be with us on Friday evening um, around uh, 8 p.m. same time as well. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, your favorite beer brand and pub while we're there. Why not? Ooh. Uh, my favorite pub is in uh, my book, The Pub Cultural Institution. Um, and it is a pub called the uh, it's called the Cooper's Tavern, Cooper's Tavern, Cooper's Arms in Burton on Trent, um, the home of IPA. Um, and if anyone wants to read about the perfect pub, there's a, if you haven't ever seen it, there's an essay that George Orwell wrote in 1946 called The Moon Underwater. And it's George Orwell's description of his perfect pub. And it's there on Google. You can find it in a second. And to me, the, the the Cooper's Tavern is 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 Orwell's Moon Underwater. He said it doesn't exist because no one pub has got everything that he loves all in the one place. And I reckon if Orwell was alive and I took him to the Cooper's Tavern, he'd go, "Oh no, this is it. This is absolutely it." Uh, my favourite beer. Uh, there's a real asshole answer to that. Is that it's the one that wh whichever one's in my hand right now. Um, but, uh, I would say I would say the most influential beer I've got is I, I think it's Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. I think um, I think I could never get bored of that beer. Uh, I would always come back to it. Really good beer. Excellent. Pete, thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, thank you. I hope that was useful. Well, under lockdown, um, I'm sure we're going to get lots of questions. If we do, we'll pass them on. Thanks, everybody. Um, and a second. Ooh, don't talk about the aura right now. <laughs> They're just scared about the beers because they can't get any, anybody. <laughs> but... Um, Cheers, Pete. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining us this fantastic evening. You can't see my glass in the picture because I've got my background on. But uh, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to everybody on YouTube for joining us for this live session. Please join us for our next session at 8 p.m. GMT plus 2 South Africa time um, for another beer boot cap session with Marzen Hajar. Thank you, everybody, to the live stream. Take care. Good night. Cheers. Are we clear, Pete? We we clear. We clear. We good. We were uh, excellent. We're good. I think.